Hello, I'm Hannah Kaplan, and this is the WCS Wild Audio Podcast, where you'll find reported audio stories covering the latest news and newsmakers from the Wildlife Conservation Society's Global Conservation Program, Zoos and Aquarium, and their many partners. We've got a great show today, so let's get to it. In the second episode of our two-part series on the current avian influenza crisis, WCS Wild Audio's Hannah Kaplan looks at the rise of this new, more deadly strain in domestic poultry farming. In places like Cambodia, such farms have become a breeding ground for the virus, and the last five years have seen a dramatic increase in rates of infection of wild birds that share the same habitats. Meanwhile, scientists continue to track the growing threat to mammals, with the recent transmission to dairy cows in the U.S. causing new concerns of potential new spillover to wildlife and people. We need to be prepared for the situation in wild birds to worsen, not just in this country, but across the region as well. Dr. Emily Denstead is a veterinarian and regional technical advisor for WCS's health program, supporting the greater Mekong and South Asian regions. She says that there's a distressing predictability to the annual avian influenza infection rates of water birds like egrets, cormorants, and herons. It happens every year at almost the same time of year in the same locations. It's actually happening right now. We respond to them every year. And there's a few colonies which have been hit annually since 2021. It's commonly during that nesting period. So we do see a lot of juveniles being impacted as well. While endangered species like the giant ibis and Bengal florican remain resilient for now, the potential impacts on their population looms ominously. Emily cautions that should avian influenza make its way into these populations, it could undo years of conservation gains in a matter of weeks or months. Their populations are increasing, but they're still in very low numbers. So if the virus finds its way into these water birds, we may see total devastation of these populations. Some of these species, we don't know how you know susceptible they are to the virus, but we need to assume that most of them are susceptible. One of the main reasons for the high number of deaths in water birds in Cambodia is the prevalence of free-range duck farming in rice paddies, where wild birds and poultry share the same habitats. Here, avian influenza can spread like wildfire in homogenous domestic bird populations and quickly make the jump to wildlife. Robert Gizard has worked with WCS in Southeast Asia since the 90s. Today, he serves as technical advisor for Cambodia's Tonle Sap Stronghold, Southeast Asia's biggest freshwater lake and the grassland habitat of critically endangered species like the Bengal florican. This is a key location for bird conservation in the region. Cambodia has the largest water bird colony in all of Southeast Asia. All of the spot-billed pelicans and the greater adjutants that are still found in, in mainland Southeast Asia are only breeding on the Tonle Sap in Cambodia. One of the bird conservation success stories here is the Asian open-billed stork. Populations are flourishing after efforts to bring back numbers began 30 years ago. But This expanding population means storks are in closer contact with farms, and as a result, more susceptible to avian influenza. The large colonies of Asian open-billed storks are getting closer and closer to people. And when they're closer to people, they're closer to people's poultry. That's where we get into this exchange of flus. And then the open-billed storks get sick and die. WCS and Cambodia's Ministry of Environment have been working hard on the ground and at policy level, for years to protect some of the most endangered bird populations. We have been in the field for 20 years. We're watching some of these very rare water birds. And then we can use our veterinary teams to get to the field to sample the sick and dying wild birds and then be able to understand how those links are happening with with livestock. New pilot projects seek to better understand factors contributing to the virus's spread. Climate, temperature, and water levels, for example. They're also working to get reliable population numbers, using artificial intelligence and drones. This applied science is critical. But, says Emily, the intensive work to curb the virus is exhausting, both mentally and physically. It's devastating to see, but also really tiring work. This is a a hot place. Um, You're wearing full PPE in the sun every day and often gathering dead birds. These outbreaks can go on and often do in Cambodia for weeks and weeks. Emily says that in order to move quickly and limit the spread, 
Formal surveillance networks across Cambodia and neighboring countries is key. WCS has been working with government partners, from forest rangers on the front lines reporting deaths to trained officials collecting data and tackling outbreaks. The Ministry of Environment themselves will find dead birds, report them to WCS, and then we go together to deal with that outbreak. So WCS has worked with government partners to scale out reporting mechanisms at a national level, including the use of a telegram group and training rangers to report sick and dead wildlife as they encounter it. Now Cambodia has kind of increased eyes and ears in the field and a mechanism for reporting these events. And this has really been key in ensuring there's early detection of unusual events involving sick or dead wildlife. What's more, the WCS team is setting up pilot projects with local duck farmers in high-risk sites, focusing on biodiversity risk reduction measures, which not only safeguard against avian influenza, but also protects farmers' health and livelihoods. It's a tough disease to prevent spread. And I mean, we've seen it get into the most biosecure commercial poultry farms in North America, but there's a lot of room for, you know, improved prevention and, and biosecurity measures there are some simple ways in which we can support them to do that a little more safely so that potentially infected ducks are not being disposed of in in the wetland. Or if a duck appears sick, supporting them and knowing how to quarantine those animals away from healthy animals. If people are not changing behavior and trying to limit that outbreak, then there's much greater threat on the threatened species that we've been working so hard to conserve. Although mass infections in mammals in Cambodia haven't been reported yet, human fatalities here, both adults and children, remind us of the virus's deadly potential. While transmission rates to humans remain low, avian influenza kills about half of those infected. Should it become easier to pass to humans from wildlife and poultry, the pandemic implications are enormous. There have been several documented cases of spillover of the virus into humans, and these cases had recent contact with infected poultry in their communities. Robert echoes this by pointing out the likelihood of mutation. You know, you have the disease expanding within poultry and within wild birds, and then it's just much higher risk of mutation. If a flu could mutate to the point where it could pass quickly from bird to person to person, then we would have a pandemic once again. Robert says that's why WCS's work is so critical here. As they're already so closely monitoring bird species, scientists will immediately sound the alarm should a mass die-off occur. As is the case all over the world right now, part of the challenge is establishing who is responsible for the management of avian influenza, who is called in when new cases are found. WCS Cambodia and partners have recently approved a standard operating procedure formalized in national policy a go-to guide for reporting sick or dead wildlife that clarifies who is responsible for wildlife health management, an element of animal health that often falls through the cracks. You have your domestic animal health sector, and then you have your environmental sector, and there's not often an understood overlap in responsibility there in terms of who do you call if there is a die-off in in wild birds, who's responsible for reporting and investigating and We'll be bringing you updates as research around this virus evolves in real time. For WCS Wild Audio, I'm Hannah Kaplan. Today's episode was produced and reported by Hannah Kaplan with help from Dan Rosen and Nat Moss. The WCS Wild Audio podcast is a production of the Wildlife Conservation Society. Please join us next week for a new episode. And don't forget to follow, rate, and review the show wherever you get your podcasts.